Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Pulse. I'm your host, Sam Red. Today, we're going to be talking about youth violence and bullying around Baltimore City. So don't go away. We'll have our friends from Johns Hopkins talking today on The Pulse. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Pulse. I'm your host, Sam Redd. Joining me today are Dr. Phil Leaf and Dr. Catherine Bradshaw of the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Leaf, tell me, why would people from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health get involved with youth violence? Well, I can tell you a personal reason and a professional reason. Okay. Uh, when I first came to Johns Hopkins about 20 years ago, I got involved in providing mental health services in the community try to make sure that there was a continuum of care that you could stay in the community, could stay in school. Right. Out of the first 150 young people we were working with, three of them got shot. Mm -hmm. We did a really good job counseling the parents, working with the families to try to make sure that this wasn't going to be a, a sort of a really bad experience for them, but right. started wondering, you know, instead of counseling parents after their children get shot, what could we be doing to actually prevent the shootings? Uh, in the United States, for those 15 to 35, homicide is the leading cause of death for African Americans. And obviously in Baltimore City, that makes it a public health problem. Right. Okay, so um, Dr. Bradshaw, tell me what area do you play in the youth violence prevention? Sure. Um, my background, in some ways similar to Phil's, I started off doing clinical work one-on-one -on -one with youth that were involved with the juvenile justice system. Mm -hmm. And through my work with them, I became to realize how many had been exposed to violence in the home or within the community or in their peer group. Issues about bullying and mm -hmm. um, violence in the media were, were very pervasive for these youth. And in many cases, I wasn't the first one trying to help them. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of missed opportunities for intervention for these kids. So I shifted my program of research over to prevention and do a lot of work with the schools and the city and surrounding school districts to try to prevent youth violence before it occurs, promote a safer, more supportive school environment so that way everybody benefits. Okay, now there are there those who will ask, is youth violence that much of a problem in Baltimore City? Well, I think, uh, I don't know who would be asking that question. If right. they, that one of, one of the ba difficult things about Baltimore City is we've had no less than 200 murders every year for right. 30 years. Right. A lot of those are young people who are okay. dying. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the perpetrators, uh, it's, it's the victims. And I have a good friend, uh, Brother Bay, Ellsworth Johnson Bay, who right. talks about hurt people hurt people. Right. We have a lot of hurting people in Baltimore. Uh, we have a lot of children who go into schools who have family issues or neighbor issues. Uh, they're worried if their parent goes out of the house, will they come back safe? Mm -hmm. uh, enormous stress on them. Uh, enormous stress on the teachers working with them. Mm -hmm. So clearly, uh, how do we make Baltimore City safe and supportive? How do we make sure that all of our children get through at childhood to become successful adults is a, okay. a critical issue. So, so how do we make Baltimore City a safer place for our children? Well, I think we've been making it, uh, get, get, getting on the track. Part of it is to realize that uh, although police are important, uh, mm -hmm. that when there is, an, when there is a shooting, uh, when there is a crime, that needs to be dealt with. But uh, when we know from the corners, people can, will just go, go replacing them. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to have both families and children in neighborhoods where people have high aspirations, where they feel that they will get through their childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, you go into most Baltimore City elementary schools, and you ask them, do you know someone who's been killed? Right. Uh, almost every single student raises their hand. That becomes their expectations. When you ask the teenagers, uh, what are you doing? What are you thinking about their future? They may say, I'm not thinking I'm going to get past 20, 21, 22. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to change those aspirations, which means starting early, uh, making sure, uh, uh, as Catherine said, that we have good prevention, that we're getting promotion, that their children have a positive trajectory. Uh, but when that doesn't occur, whether it's because of substance abuse in the families or because someone has been incarcerated or has been killed, uh, we need to, as a city, make sure that we're coming around and making sure that our schools support them, our neighborhoods support them, and our faith communities support those okay. people. Well, well, how do we identify those youth that are at risk? 
Well, there are a couple of different ways that we can do that. Certainly when they're involved in school, you can look at their academic performance or behavior problems that might be occurring in the school environment, things like suspensions or missing a lot of school. Those are typically early indicators that youth mm. might be at risk for violence. In fact, the city did a review of some of the youth sh shootings that Phil was involved with and found um, youth that were victims of homicide as well as perpetrators. Some of the early indicators were things like poor attendance and getting held back in terms of grades. So academic performance and academic engagement right. are really very important indicators and that's why most of my work focuses on the school setting, trying to improve the school environment so it will cut down on things like youth violence that occur both within the school as well as in the community. Now how do you improve the school environment? Right. So we've been involved in a couple of different evidence-based programs that we've been helping to bring to Baltimore and more generally to the state of Maryland. Um, one model that Phil and I have been involved with is called Positive Behavioral Interventions and mm -hmm. Supports. We call it PBIS. And we've been involved in some large-scale research studies and documented significant impacts on the climate of the schools, cutting down things like kids getting sent to the principal's office and suspensions, as well as things like violence, uh, aggressive and violent behavior, um, bullying, and peer rejection. So there are several benefits um, from doing this kind of program. Quite often it takes a couple of years to get in place. It's not a change that happens overnight. And the effects aren't huge, but they really are a step in the right direction. And it does provide an opportunity for youth to come to school and feel a bit safer. And we know that that's very critical, the safety of students. Okay. So this, the youth violence that we're experiencing in Baltimore City is not strictly a law enforcement issue? No. In fact, that's uh, a big push that we have within the area of public health is to talk about prevention. Mm -hmm. um, certainly there's a very important role that law enforcement plays, but quite often that's a bit more after the fact. And um, prevention sometimes doesn't get a lot of attention in the media. Right. You right. don't show up and say, hey, we prevented 15 homicides this month. But rather, um, you often just see the attention that's given after mm -hmm. the fact. Are there numbers and studies that show how much prevention is really helping in the city? Yeah, there have been some longitudinal studies that some of our colleagues have been involved in um, where they implemented programs just in early elementary schools, say mm -hmm. kindergarten, first grade, and uh, one particular model called the Good Behavior Game that classroom teachers implement, and their long-term benefits of that, both academic but more importantly, violence-related outcomes. So youth that participated in this long-term study, we have data from our colleagues Nick Ilongo and Chef Kellum that show long-term impacts on involvement in violence from just implementing a one-year program in first grade. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Another thing is looking at some of the early indicators. So we know that children who aren't coming to school regularly, they both have academic problems, but they also then wind up spending more time on the streets. One of the things in the past that our agencies haven't worked all that well together, so we'd have good after-school programs, but children who are in, say, foster homes might not have access to them. Mm -hmm. Or children who weren't coming in regularly, the parents would get called. But if you were in a foster home, the foster parent wouldn't get called. And now our Department of Social Services and Juvenile Services and the schools are working much more together to try to, again, these are early, you know, when ch a child's in first or second grade, they're not coming to school because they don't want to come to school. They're coming to school often because other things are going on in their home. Okay. Hold that thought. Uh, I want to talk more about the grants that you're receiving, and I want to talk more about bullying when we come back. Don't go away. When we come back on The Pulse, we'll have continue with our guests. Welcome back to The Pulse. If you're just joining me, our guests today are Dr. Phil Leaf and Dr. Catherine Bradshaw of the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. So Dr. Bradshaw, uh, I was watching CNN the other night and I think everybody's watching news and seeing in the public that a lot of the, the big focus now is on the bullying issue uh, in our community, in our schools. Um, tell me about what you're doing with bullying. Sure. I think one thing that's important to start off with, with is a definition of bullying. And bullying is a form of aggressive behavior that occurs within the context of a power differential, and that could be based on size or social status. Mm. It's intentional aggressive behavior, so it's not accidental, and it typically occurs multiple times, so not just a one-time mm. act. And there's been some research really dating back to the school shootings that happened back in Columbine mm -hmm. in the late 1990s that really put bullying on the map and how it relates to other forms of youth violence, including school violence. And since then, there's been quite a lot of research, some of our own research here in the Maryland area, 
has examined things like risk factors for involvement in bullying, parent-child communication around bullying, what to do when somebody bullies you, whether you should hit back or you should seek help. So we have a long uh, line of research in this area. So would you say that, that the chil children who are bullying have at some point been bullied themselves or uh, what type of background was making them become the aggressive bullying person? Well, one risk factor for being a perpetrator of bullying is certainly witnessing bullying in mm -hmm. the home or within the, the uh, television or peer environment. So not every youth that is uh, bullied is going to end up going on to bully others, right. but that's certainly a risk factor from watching others and seeing aggression modeled as a successful strategy for resolving problems. Uh, that's really what we're trying to work against because it isn't successful in the long term. It might help you get your needs met right then and there, mm -hmm. but you're likely to get in trouble and then as a long-term strategy it's really not going to work out. Are there signs for parents of children who are being bullied that they can pick up? Because I'm sure that a lot of times the children that are being bullied are afraid mm -hmm. to come forth. Are there signs that parents can pick up or school teachers or persons that are working with children can pick up that their children are being, being bullied? Right. Some um, pretty obvious signs are things like changes in routines. If a student usually takes the bus home and suddenly decides that they want to start walking home instead of riding the bus, uh, change in the way that they're interacting with other peers. There were kids that they used to hang out with that they don't hang out with anymore. Um, avoiding certain events, maybe when avoiding school altogether because that might be where the bullying is happening. Mm -hmm. Even tattered clothing or missing items that might indicate physical uh, forms of bullying and certainly changes in their mental health. Are they seeming sad? Do they seem angry? Or, um, that would all be potential indicators of, of involvement in bullying. Okay. And Dr. Lee, if you work a lot with the Baltimore City School Systems, what, what type of uh, action are the schools taking when it comes to this bullying problem? Well, well one is they're, they're trying to make sure that they realize that there's a problem and, as you mentioned, teachers. But another key constituency are the students themselves, mm -hmm. uh, what they find acceptable, what they're, what they're willing to get involved in. And so a number of the programs really try to make sure that the students realize that they create the climate in the schools. A lot of times the teachers are reacting to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so making sure that they realize they have responsibility for having a positive climate there and also uh, that there are adults, often teachers, uh, sometimes someone who's not a teacher. There are other, lots of people in the school that teachers feel comfortable, that students feel right. comfortable with, that there's someone they can go to, whether it's a parent or somebody else in the school, to talk about these things. Tell me more about the Center for Youth Violence and, and what you all do, who you partner with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we have the Center for Prevention of Youth Violence, mm -hmm. and funded by the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, we're starting our 11th year now, uh, and it's been funded over time to help develop, to participate in collaborations. Uh, besides being a professor at Johns Hopkins, I'm also on the Family League Board. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also involved in a number of faith-based initiatives. Right. And, and we realize from a public health perspective that all the segments and communities are, are critical if we're going to have a safe and healthy community. Right. Uh, so what we've been working on is a number of instances, uh, particularly with schools, as Catherine has, has mentioned, because schools are where students are and also where they can get a very bad start for their lives. So mm -hmm. it's important to make sure they're succeeding there. But also with the after-school programs, uh, with the young parents, to make sure that they are getting a good start with their own children and getting the skills so that they can be nurturing and that their children have early childhood experiences. Then with the Head Start programs, and then equally important as the children are transitioning into adulthood, so they have some positive mentors, uh, so they have some positive aspirations, and that their their capacities are really getting reinforced. Not mm -hmm. just often we focus on on people's limitations and skills, a lack of skills or lack of achievement, and the important part is making sure that we're ensuring that all of our children are succeeding. Exactly, uh, Dr. Bradshaw, tell me, um, are there locations or websites that people can go to uh, to find out more about bullying or what's going on in the area of bullying? Sure. I think one of the best uh, research-based sites to go to for bullying prevention is the site stopbullying.gov, mm -hmm. and it's put out by the government. Um, there was a White House summit earlier this year where President Obama drew some national attention right. to the issue of bullying, and so there's some materials from that, uh, from that event. Um, I was pleased to participate in that event and so prepared Wonderful. some research reviews that are available online for that. But there are a great number of tip sheets that are available for students, parents, teachers, bus drivers, you name right. it. 
you can go to that site, even community members, how to put together a public service announcement around okay. bullying. It's a variety of different resources, so that's www.stopbullying, just as one word, dot gov. Okay. Tell me about some of the grants that you've received and some of the upcoming projects that you have also on the agenda. As Phil mentioned, we have the CDC Center mm -hmm. that's been funded and that hosts a variety of different smaller projects and in uh, many ways we've been able to bundle those together to try to implement strategies in the school, in the community, in the home so that way they can really hit multiple levels. We've also been doing some work with the Maryland State Department of Education to extend some of these activities to other school districts around the state. So one of which we're partnering with the Maryland State Department of Education and Shepherd Brett Health System on a large federal initiative called Safe and Supportive Schools. Okay. And so that includes 60 high schools from across the state where we're looking at the link between school climate and issues around safety and student engagement. How uh, successful are we at right now at tackling this problem of bullying and youth violence in our city, in our state, uh, in our country? Well, I think the national attention to the issue of bullying has really been incredible. Um, it's been very important to have the president stand up there and talk about his own personal experiences with bullying and really draw a lot of national attention to that. Sometimes people will look at the national attention and think, oh, things must be getting worse. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of the national data suggests we're at least leveling off, if not headed down, in terms of the rates of bullying, which is a great thing. doesn't mean that it's going to go away. Chances are it never will go away. Okay. We know on average about 30 percent of youth are frequently involved in bullying, and that's a large chunk. Um, especially when you look at across the life course, most people have been involved in bullying at one time right. of their life. Exactly. Dr. Leaf, what uh, kind of advice do you give my viewing audience on youth violence and, and, and prevention and um, just staying safe in our communities? Well, I think part of it is, is being involved in the communities and recognizing that we all play a role uh, in the same way that we play a role in our own health and making sure we're making good decisions. Uh, we all have people we work with, nieces, nephews. Uh, we need to make sure that they're safe and supportive and when they do have negative things happen to them, uh, that there is a, a supportive system around them. Again, family, uh, community, schools, faith communities are, are, are all, all critical. Uh, but we also have to, again, realize that the violence is, is really not acceptable uh, and that we need to provide opportunities for people so that they can uh, have positive ways of interacting with each other and also succeed. Okay. I want to thank you both for coming on the show today. And I'm sure that uh, that what you all are doing is going to be quite effective in our community. Great. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. Thank you. Don't go away. When we come back, we'll have more on The Pulse. Welcome back to The Pulse. I'm your host, Sam Redd. Joining me now is Dr. Daniel Webster of the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Violence and Research. Gun Policy and Research. Okay. Close that, enough. All right. Dr. Webster, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So tell me about the center. Um, yeah, ours is the only academic center, really, that, that focuses exclusively on gun policy mm -hmm. and uh, research to inform gun policy. Uh, while our faculty members, including myself, have been working on the issue of gun policy uh, for decades, we were fortunate enough to get a grant from a foundation to create the center in 1995. Mm -hmm. And our mission really is to both to conduct rigorous scientific research that will inform our policy decisions about how we reduce gun violence and other gun-related injuries, but also to uh, try to synthesize what is known scientifically about these issues and to present it to uh, the media, to the public, to policymakers, and, and generally try to advance uh, the prevention of gun violence. Okay, so tell me, how is the uh the prevention of gun violence a health issue as opposed to a police or moral issue? I think that uh, clearly if you look at um, things like years of productive life lost, mm -hmm. meaning basically um, uh, what are young people being killed from, mm -hmm. um, as well as not only the mortality side of it but the uh, large morbidity side. So there are huge health impacts from gun violence. Um, and as you say, traditionally we've thought of this pretty exclusively within the confines of uh, what do we do to lock people up after they shoot people right. or to generally uh, treat it exclusively as a moral problem. 
I think public health brings to this uh, problem uh, an orientation towards prevention, mm -hmm. um, uh, a tradition of applying s the best science to the problem, mm -hmm. and uh, really in, in a much more creative problem-solving sort of orientation. Now, I, I want to clarify that um, in our view, public safety, it's not an either-or thing. It's not law enforcement or public health. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the work that I've done, I've always thought of them as uh, partners. Right. You really need a co complementary approach to address something like violence. And uh, much of my work really focuses on how we can, uh, what are the best law enforcement practices from a prevention standpoint, mm -hmm. not only after the fact. Uh, so that, I think, distinguishes us mostly the prevention orientation. Now, in your study and research, are you tracking why people use guns in violence uh, and why and where these guns are coming from and who's using these guns? Well, we certainly focus on where the guns are coming from and who's using them. Uh, a lot of our orientation, getting back to sort of the uh, unique approach from public health standpoint, is uh, we've always been very interested in understanding where are these guns coming from. They don't drop out of the sky right. into the hands of a dangerous person. Uh, so a great uh, deal of, of our research and work is focused on understanding how guns, what we talk about, go from legal to mm -hmm. illegal context, right. okay? And what we found is that, not always, but quite frequently, there are uh, gun dealers who don't always play by all the rules. Right. Uh, I'm not saying that all gun dealers do. Actually, most gun dealers, I think, are, are quite law-abiding and, and play by the rules. Right. But it only takes a few to have a really big impact uh, and a lot of our attention is focused on, on that problem. The other way uh, is we have in this country, now, now Maryland does not, we have in this country a huge loophole in our gun laws. Mm -hmm. um, I think almost all of us agree that uh, we don't want dangerous people to have guns. Right. We agreed as a, as a country back in uh, 1994 when they passed the Brady Law that you should have a background check to make sure that you're not a prohibited individual. Sure. But it has a gigantic loophole. Uh, private sellers don't have to go through the background check process. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, that is what our research has found is, is usually contributes to, again, this diversion of guns from legal context to illegal context. So the two things we focus on, private seller loophole, as well as uh, the gun dealers inadequately regulated and, and to make sure that they uh, abide by the laws. Okay. My earlier guests were Dr. Phil Leaf and Dr. Bradshaw from the Center for Prevention of Youth Violence, and I'm sure you're quite familiar and work very closely with them. Yes. How does uh, youth violence and gun policy tie together? Um, well, again, recognizing that um, Homicide plays a, such an important role in the health of young people. And in cities like Baltimore, more than 90% of the homicides involve a firearm. Mm -hmm. So um, I have worked on sort of two fronts. One is doing everything I can through research policy development to uh, minimize the number of guns readily available to young people as right. well as other potentially dangerous individuals. Um, and, and that is quite critical because even if you're doing everything right on the prevention side, right. young people are always going to get into arguments, um, heated exchanges, emotions sure. overtake him, and if a gun is read readily available, a life is lost. Okay. Actually, we focus on someone who's killed, but even the person pulling the trigger, in many ways, their life is, <laughs> is not going to be worth much after sure. that, that as well. Um, on the other side of the coin, recognizing that it'll be a long time before we deal with all the guns that are on the street now illegally, um, what are the best ways to reduce the likelihood that someone is going to use a gun? Sure. When, and so uh, I've been really excited to be involved in evaluating 
Baltimore Safe Streets program, where the whole orientation of that program is um, to minimize shootings by changing social norms, mm -hmm. identifying the highest risk individuals, young people in, in the highest risk neighborhoods with the backgrounds that suggest that they might be at risk, mentoring, and being out on the street in the context when we know these things go down, we're there on the spot and they can provide alternatives to picking up a gun to settle a dispute. What other partners, you mentioned Safe Street, so what other partners are you working with? Well, um, I work very closely with the Baltimore Police Department. Uh, we were fortunate enough to uh, receive a grant the police department did from the U.S. Department of Justice mm -hmm. for something uh, that's called a Smart Policing Initiative. Right. It's a national program where they are encouraging partnerships between researchers and law enforcement agencies to uh, develop new uh, and innovative approaches to uh, combating crime and uh, conduct rigorous search to, to inform, to, to know whether that's working. How long, so, how long is that grant for? This is a two-year grant, mm -hmm. and uh, we're focused on, on looking on three important initiatives that uh, Baltimore uh, has undertaken. Um, one is called Project Exile, mm -hmm. um, which um, the thing that we're focusing on for this piece is the call-in piece, right. which has a, uh, a prevention aspect to it. Um, they call in individuals who have a history of violence. Uh, they inform them that uh, if they make the, the wrong choices, they might be vulnerable to federal prosecution. But really what it's about is offering these alternatives at the same time. There's a carrot stick component to sure. this in which uh, uh, service providers, uh, uh, faith leaders, um, the community generally says, we want to help you redirect your life. Um, so that's one program. Another program is called the Violent Crime Impact Section. This is a, a team of detectives that are deployed to the parts of the city that have had the uh, most shootings. Sure. They, in, in police world, they call them hot spots. Um, and the detectives are deployed to those units each unit takes maybe a slightly different approach, but the general thing that they're trying to do is um, deter illegal gun carrying, possession, mm -hmm. uh, look for individuals who, again, who might be at the high risk end of the continuum, and make sure that they know uh, that the police are there if they are to pick up a gun. Okay. Again, sort of a deterrent kind of approach. The last thing that we're looking at is um, the gun offender registry that uh, was adopted. And uh, Baltimore was really, I think, only the second place to try this uh, approach. So it, it operates somewhat similarly to a sex offender registry. So if you commit certain um, gun offenses that you're convicted of, uh, after you've done your time, you come back into the community, you have to report your whereabouts, and the police will uh, knock on your door occasionally and make sure that uh, the gun offenders know that the police are watching them. Okay. I want you to, we, we talked earlier about the grants and how politics can get involved in, um, in these grants. Um, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk more about that. Okay. Don't go away. We'll be back more with more on The Pulse. I want to thank my guests for coming on the show today to talk about such a serious problem as youth violence and bullying. And as always in parting, Stay focused, stay informed, and keep your finger on the pulse of our community. I'm Denise. I'm Lindsay. Stacy. Jane. I was molested. Sexually assaulted. Gun when I was four years old. When I was 18. When I was in college. When I was 33. It's not my shame to carry. I did nothing wrong. It wasn't my fault. Rape, Rape is not, not your fault. fault. Rape is a very personal and terrible crime that leaves deep physical and emotional wounds. I've been working hard to improve Baltimore's response to survivors of rape. We've set up a rape helpline, given police specialized training, and funded more advocates. We are far from done, and we'll keep working until every victim feels that they have a voice and every offender 
has been held accountable for their crimes. Remember, you are not alone. Call and get help today. I thought he was my friend. Was it my fault? I shouldn't have gone there. Was it my fault? I was drunk. Was it my fault? No one will believe me. Was it my fault? Rape, Rape is, is not, not your fault. fault.